Hey there, good morning team. Are you ready for some weird mind-bending stuff? So get prepared for the next couple of videos. You know, watch your Monty Python. You know, eat or ingest whatever you need to put yourself in a special frame of mind. <laughs> Relax, do some yoga beforehand. It's going to get weird. Um, I, You know, trying to summarize quantum theory in in at this level tends to raise more questions and open more doors than it it really answers you know what i'm saying so i'll do my best to try to summarize it right i took a you know in graduate school for my phd we have to take you know a whole year of you know graduate level quantum mechanics Woo! That was not the easiest journey I ever took. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to start with an, just an introductory video just to give you a very over, oversimplified perspective of what the difference is between classical theory and quantum theory and why was quantum theory developed in the first place, how it has changed our viewpoint of of just nature and science in general it is been, it, one of the revel, you know real revolutions in science that has occurred over the last couple of centuries huge one you can think of newton as being one of them um but wow this is some cuckoo stuff but i'll try to really simplify try to take the hardcore mathematics out of it if you want to learn that stuff you can take physical chemistry graduate level quantum mechanics have fun we just want a qualitative overview of it and why it helps us do what we're doing all right so anyway this really started coming up we were fine you know uh you know up through the mid to late you know 1860s 1870s 80, 1880s everything was the machine was moving fine it was well oiled physics classical physicists were like yeah we pretty much know everything we're just getting things out to more decimal places let's just apply our information but we 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 got it we got it everybody we got it nailed down we're good okay and because they could explain everything all of the experimental observations that have been seen they they could be theoretically explained using classical theory you know we talked about wave behavior we could we could mathematically look at waves right we understand that newtonian mechanics you know the, the newton's laws all that kind of stuff we could explain all of the stuff we observed Everything was good, and everybody was happy at the party. And then three people showed up at the party and ruined it for everybody. <laughs> right? People kind of like threw it under the carpet for a while going, well, we're, we are pretty happy right now. We don't want you to ruin the party. But it's just one of those things that was an inevitability. It, it didn't happen, you know, right away. It took decades and decades to really start to alter people's thinking. It took some big wigs like Einstein to really get people thinking differently. But in the, you know, 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, there were some observations that were made or the ones that had been made, you know, for a long time before that, but nobody tried to explain it. And when they had tried to explain them, and we'll talk, we'll briefly tell, I'm going to do one video on each of those particular observations, but I'm just going to introduce them here on the next board. But when somebody attempted to explain them using classical theory or what they call classical mechanics using classical mathematics, right? Newtonian based, wave theory based, whatnot, they couldn't explain these three observations. They're like, oh. that was the big scientific oh crap moment, right? Hmm, should I tell anybody? Should we just put our head in the sand like an ostrich and ignore this? Yeah, you can do that for a little while, but it just starts gnawing at certain people, right? These could not be explained that way. And it forced people, you know, a lot of them against their will, uh, to look at this new way of thinking called quantum theory. So I want to, let's, let's look at the three different experiments real quick. And then I just want to compare and contrast qualitatively in a very fundamental way, classical thinking versus quantum thinking and what they're applied to, what's the fundamental difference between them. And then we'll look in great detail at these three different experiments or observations uh, and how applying classical theory didn't work, why it failed. This is what they predicted. This is what the experiments saw. They were, oops, the old crap moment. And then when somebody actually applied a totally radical different way of thinking called quantum mechanics, their theory was able to match the experimental observations. And everybody was like, oh, whoa, crazy. How is that even possible? And then, then the big brains really started chugging along 
And wow, or the early 19, late 1800s, early 1900s, what a time to be alive as a physicist at that time. Whoa! All right, so let's look at, I'll just briefly introduce the three different observations that started, started this whole adventure called quantum theory. So here are the three observations slash experiments that really spun these classical physicists for a loop. All right? Um, not in any particular order. I guess the order I do it is, is when I explain these, it kind of helps tell the story a little better. So it's not really in, you know, which one is discovered first, et cetera, et cetera, or even characterized first. It was, it was the concepts. I think they flow a little better for the story that I'm going to tell. I'm just going to tell some grand overarching quantum development story. A lot of history, and unfortunately a lot of history I'm going to leave out too, but Pretty much, it, you know, there's going to be so, no, so many sprinkled Nobel Prizes all over the place in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's just nuts. It would be so great to time travel back to this time and sit amongst some of these people to see what they were originally talking about and how they, how they figured this stuff out. It's amazing. So w watch the story unfold, and hopefully you'll be impressed. I don't know. You might just be like, I just want to go watch uh, you know, Avengers again or something. All right, black body radiation. I'm not going to go into details on the experiments here. I'm just introducing the three, and then we'll do literally a video for each specific one. But black body radiation, you know, humans have been observing this for centuries, if not millennia. You, you know, you, you know, go do a, a hot dog or a marshmallow roast. You know, you ever take an old hanger or something, and stick the marshmallow on the end of the hanger, stick it in the fire, and, and the wire starts changing colors. Ooh, it's red hot. It's white hot. Hoo, hoo, hoo. You know, you got your element, you know, uh, you know you're heating something up there. If you don't have a gas burner, you got the element. It starts glowing different colors based on the temperature. Um, stars being different colors. Yeah, but that's, that's called black body radiation. It's just heat uh, or radiation emitted by uh, a solid body, right, at a particular temperature. So explaining that didn't work classically. Well, it's called the ultraviolet catastrophe. We'll show you what that is in the next video. And we'll talk about who explained it and introduce the actual, find out Planck, uh, kind of the, the the grandfather of all quantum mechanics uh, explained that and really was the first one to introduce the quanta or quantum concept. And everybody's like, whoo. Next, we'll talk about the photoelectric effect. Didn't make Einstein famous, but that was his only Nobel Prize. He should have got like four or five of them. Man, he got screwed. Um, so really, Heinrich Hertz in 1888 was first to really, you know, experiment with this. Couldn't explain it. Einstein, we, Einstein had to wait for Planck's ideas to be able to explain the photo, photoelectric effect, you know, borrowed his quantum concepts and found out that they applied and worked to explain it. Um, and we'll look at the photoelectric effect where you, you know, have a, some metal, hit it with some light, some electromagnetic radiation, and electrons spit off. I'm trying to explain the characteristics of those electrons spitting off the surface of a metal, kind of like with cathode ray tubes we talked about with J.J. Thompson. Yeah, I couldn't explain that classically. It didn't work. Oh no, something's wrong or flawed. One of the two. Or we're just missing something. And then atomic line spectra. So it was kind of in the 1860s. Uh, uh, Bunsen and Kirchhoff. Bunsen, does that ring a bell? Bunsen, lab people. Bunsen burner. So he actually developed the Bunsen burner to be able to view things. They take different elements. If you've ever done flame tests, you put an element on a little like nichrome wire, dip a solution in there, and whoo, you know, it'd be like blue or green or red. You're like, that's cool. What's going on? Uh, spectroscopes just allowed them to take radiation emitted by elements, uh, you know, think of it like going through a prism or something that caused dispersion, and then they could see the individual spectral lines, the individual colors with the spectroscope. Didn't mean they could explain it, um, but they were able to, to see that. They actually, you know, identified some new elements, I think, like rubidium and cesium doing it that way. Like, oh, look at that line. We've never seen that one before. Oh, that's cesium. That's rubidium. Pretty cool. And then Balmer really was the first one to really try to explain it. He didn't have a theory, right? Trying to explain, I think, the hydrogen uh, atomic line spectra, the, the colors of hydrogen that were emitted. We'll find out that you know, they were kind of surprised only specific colors were emitted. They're like, whoa, why is, why is that? Classically couldn't explain it. So he kind of empirically characterized it. So he didn't really have a theory that uh, an equation was derived from. I'm not going to put the equation up here. So, but he made an equation to fit the data. 
You know what I mean? It's like, well, I know the answer ahead of time, so let's just make an equation that works. And he was able to do that empirically and come up with Balmer's equation to explain the atomic line spectra, hydrogen, the, the, color, the specific colors that emitted. Um, but he couldn't explain why. Uh, and, and that kind of showed that it, you had to have this quantized view to try to explain the data, but he couldn't understand why. There was no theory that, that derived that, right? Um, so let's just do a little comparison contrast between quantum and classical, and then we'll actually get into the gory details. All right, real, real oversimplified comparison contrast between classical theory or mechanics and quantum mechanics, right? Mechanics like mathematics. Real over, but this is just the gist of the whole thing, right? So when you're looking at classical theory, and we've got some system we're studying, whether it's a star or you know whatever it is, a heated wire, anything you're studying, the basic idea is that all energy values were allowed. It's called continuous. If there's a transfer of energy, there can be a continuous transfer of energy. There's no limitations on what the energy values can be. It could be you know, if this is the minimum maximum, it could be anything in between. It's kind of like uh, taking an elevator or an escalator up from the first floor to the third floor, right? You you are you are physically, I mean, not you know, th think of it as you know, like an escalator. You're physically touching every height, whereas stairs, you're only touching this height and this height and this height. Whereas an escalator, you're zzz, consistently hitting each one, right? Or take a car, right? If you're starting at zero, you start accelerating, you go to 60 miles an hour, you literally hit every speed all the way through, right? You're continuously moving from zero to 60 or whatever it is. This applies to what we call the macroscopic realm, baseballs and, and military, you know, grenade launchers and all that kind of fun stuff, right? So we, and it's so well known. I mean, it's amazing what they can do. They can, they can calculate pretty much, I mean, for me to like send a satellite or something or, or a spaceship and have it land on a specific spot, like on another planetary body, like the moon or Mars. Whoa, that's some crazy calculations. They can account for all this stuff and they can get these exact calculations and, and no get these exact answers. It's phenomenal with how accurate these things are. But when you apply it to the atomic or subatomic realm, bleh, right? Turns out there's, there's a way where classical mechanics from the macroscopic or big realm, you know, you start shrinking things smaller and it works and works and works. But when you start getting down to the atomic level, especially the subatomic level, it kind of falls apart. And there's this transition between the classical and quantum realm where, where you have to now apply quantum mechanics or quantum theory to understand what's going on, you know, electron motion, things like that. So they call that quantum mechanics, and I'm going to show you the story of how it was proposed and, and, and morphed over time into what we have today. The fundamental difference between classical and quantum is quantum theory, if you look at a system and its energies, it's not continuous. It cannot have all values. Quantum mechanics says there's only a limited specific set of energy values a system can have. We call that discrete. Some people call it discontinuous or discrete or quant the term quantized. That'd be like walking up the stairs. You can be here, here, here. Or if I had a quantum car, for example, boom, say it's a stick ship, right? And I mean, you know, I start at zero. I hit the, hit the gas and I go to first gear and I'm instantly going 20 miles an hour. I didn't hit any speed in between. Well, and then I shift to second gear and I'm going 40 miles an hour. I didn't hit any speed between 20 and 40. I'm just 0, 20, 40, 60, 80 based on the, 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 the gears. That's it. Whereas a classical car, I'm accelerating through every single speed. See the difference? So there's a limited or discrete set or quantized set of energy values um, for a particular system. It's a really weird radical concept. But it turns out that works for the subatomic and atomic realm. So let's start with black body radiation. Let's go through, you know, what the experimental data was, what did it show, what happened when they tried to explain it using classical mechanics and why it failed, and then why it worked using a quantum quantized concept, right? And that started the whole notion. Then we'll get to the photoelectric effect where Einstein stepped in, really started to change a lot of minds, and then we'll get to atomic line spectra, which will get to the development of um how we started to change our view of the atom, all right?
So we're going from that nuclear atom, which we had from Rutherford, and we're going to get to what's called Bohr's view of the atom or the planetary model, where we really start looking at that. We've kind of just been going, yeah, we know that the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus and the electrons are outside. And that was about the extent of it, right? But now we're going to really start looking at these electrons and going, what's going on here?